I want to make a quick announcement to parents so that you know, and really to everyone, if you, uh, if you need to go outside. If you haven't been out there since you've came in, the, the ground is littered with Easter eggs everywhere. Uh, the children are going to their lesson, and then they'll end today with an Easter egg hunt. But I wanted to reassure parents, we have, we've closed the gates up for this time. That way they, none of your children go wandering off into Lake Wales searching for eggs far into the community. We don't, want to, we don't want to be blamed for any of that. So um, there's one gate that's still unlocked, but it looks as though it's locked. So we just wanted to reassure you of that, that your children will be safe during this time. If you're new with us today, uh, my name is Pastor Joe Craft, pastor here of Awakened Church, and we welcome you. If you are new, we encourage you to stop at the table in the back. That's our welcome table. Uh, pick up one of the connection cards that's there, fill it out, let us know who you are uh, so that we can come bother you and call you all week long and encourage you to come back. So please do that. Uh, a lot of things coming up in April that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, it's a very busy, busy month, and so I'm, I'm glad you're here today because I really want you to get the fullness of this month and encourage you to be a part of everything that's going on at Awaken Church. The first is next Sunday. Next Sunday is our Vision Sunday. Uh, it seems a little late in the year, of course, but God is providing as He will. And so next week is an important Sunday to be here for all of our members and vet visitors as well, uh, that God's placed a vision on my heart to bring to our church. And so we'll be casting that vision next week in a lot of different areas of ministry moving forward through the summer and into the fall as well. So please be here next Sunday if you can for Vision Sunday. That'll be very exciting for all of us. And then on the 15th, the next Sunday after that, is uh, Missions Sunday. And so really want to encourage you for that. We have five of our young adults and youth that will be speaking on different mission trips uh, that they will be going on this summer and, and looking for your support and prayers as well. And then we also have a guest speaker coming on that day to talk about an opportunity that we have as a church and some of our families uh, on a mission project to help Chinese students that are coming to America this summer to learn English. And so Come with a receptive heart and ready to receive. We're really excited for that day as well. On the 22nd, the Sunday after the 15th, we're just follow with me, we're going Sunday by Sunday, is a Service Sunday. And we want you to be here for that Sunday. We're going to talk about service opportunities. That's part of our vision moving forward. Uh, next week, there'll be a sign up for that day because we'll have a luncheon right after service. The church will provide, and we're encouraging you to stay. If you want to be a part of service and a part of what's happening that awakening, and whether it's to be with our first impression team, those are people that shake your hands. Uh, if you're a hugger, we need you on that team because sometimes I feel like I'm the only hugger here. And so we want more huggers on that team uh, to help with security and with children's and with worship. Any, any part of what you see that happens at Awaken, that takes volunteers to do. And so if you're not serving right now, we want to encourage you to do that. And so be here on the 22nd. Again, sign up next week so we'll know who's coming for the lunch so we know how much to provide for. And then the last Sunday of the month, we're going to start our newcomers class again called Starting Point. And that'll be at 930. We offer small groups at 930, not today because of our breakfast, but starting back next week. And want to encourage you to come for that time of study. And then again, if you're going to be a part of service, come and be a part on the 29th, our newcomers course that lasts for four weeks and just kind of get acclimated into Awaken and find out what we're all about and the ministry that God's doing here through this church. So very excited for that. Uh, very excited also right now too. Um, some of you get really too excited about this next part of our Easter service. We did this last year. Um, so we, you know, we, we know the true meaning of Easter and we come today to celebrate Christ. But we just, we felt last year when we, it was our first Easter here at Candlelight, we thought it was just really unfair that the children get to go do their lesson and then they have this great Easter egg hunt. And we thought, why does that stop when we're adults? You know, like, I like to hunt for Easter eggs and get candy and money and gift cards. And uh, so, you can see around the room right now, some of you have been staking them out since you came. You didn't even worship. I saw you. You were just pointing out Easter eggs, wherever they may be. So, these were not for kids. These are for adults. These are for you and uh, for anyone that's left in the room today. So, they're up on the stage they're all around. Uh, you don't have to participate, of course, if you want, but I'm going to give you one minute. When I say go, get ready. Get on the edge of your seats. Come on. I'm s we're doing this right now so that you'll actually listen to the word today and not be distracted by all these eggs, okay? You got one minute. When I say go, get the eggs and then back to your seat. On your mark.
That's good. Shoes off. That's good. Get set. Go. Go. All right, thank you so much. That was good. That was good. Nobody got hurt this year. Last year it was really aggressive. So, I, I know. <laughs> um, actually, funny story. Funny story, really quick. Someone had just said, you know, that I should get an egg, which I really appreciate. La- last year, my father-in-law was here. And uh, yeah, I'll take one. Thanks so much. And uh, last year, my father-in-law was here. And um, for my father-in-law to be here in service was, was a really, really big deal. And we were really, really, uh, really excited for him to be here. And uh, to, to, to bless me on that day, he had left me an Easter egg up here filled with $100. <laughs> to, to which someone found. Uh, not me. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am, I had not. So who are they going to see? Okay, Mr. Dennis is standing there in back. Dennis, give him a wave right there. Thank you. Uh, so some of the eggs have little cards, that little papers with like a number or something that you won. So after service, if you'll see Mr. Dennis, uh, because that means you probably won a gift card. So you are one of the lucky ones. So, All right. Well, let's get to God's Word today. Let me pray for us, and then we have a couple uh, things that we're going to watch, and then we'll be studying today from the book of Matthew chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to flip there. Let me pray again for our Word and study. God, Lord, we just love you. We thank you for fun. We thank you for fellowship. Lord, I just thank you that you smile upon us. And Lord, as we go to a time of study today, as we look at the actions of Peter Lord, in the actions of Christ, I just pray that we will be changed and transformed from your word. We love you, Father, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Jesus declared, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. I am the bread of life. If you come to me, you will never go hungry. And if you believe in me, you will never be thirsty. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who did the crowd say that I am? They answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say that a prophet of long ago has come back to life. What about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out to the crowd and said, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, he said. With this, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I told you that I am he. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness had come over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Surely, this was a righteous man. On the first day of the week, the women found the stone rolled away. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. He is not here. He has risen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. I am the first and I am the last, and apart from me there is no God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, even I, am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no Savior. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the living God. I am in the world, and I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the first, and I am the last. I am God Almighty. I am the God of your Father. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. I am the I am. If you stand with me, please, in respect to God's word as we read today. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13 through 17. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Am. Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. This is a pivotal point in Scripture here in the ministry of Christ and the relationship that Jesus shared with his disciples. When Jesus asked, but who do you say I am? He was not just asking Peter alone, but he was asking all of his disciples collectively. But who do you say that I am? If we look just at chapter 16 of Matthew, we see some major events in Jesus' ministry that caused others, possibly even his disciples, to question their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. 
If you look back in your word at the beginning of chapter 16 and 1 through 4, we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which we've seen throughout Scripture of Jesus' ministry, and they are demanding the sign of Jesus, to which Jesus calls them an evil and adulterous generation, that they would seek a sign apart from the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah spent three nights and days in the belly of a whale, so also Jesus was prophesying his own death and burial in the tomb. In Matthew 16, 5 through 12, he warns his disciples of false teaching. Again, about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, telling the disciples to watch and beware of the leaven of yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees for their false teaching. Like yeast affects bread and causes it to expand and to grow, the lies of these two religious groups was spreading and expanding deception and falsehood among the people. And then in Matthew 16, 13 through 20, some of which we read, Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. And as Jesus says, due to the faith and leadership of Peter, you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And all of these events, those that opened with a warning to stay clear of false teaching and to the relationship Jesus shared with his disciples, they led to one question. And it's a question that we must ask ourselves this morning. Who do you say I am? I want you to imagine for a moment if Jesus was standing with us today, he probably wouldn't be wearing an an Easter egg colored jacket. I've got that compliment lots today. Thanks so much. It's the only Sunday I get to wear this. So, but If he was standing before us this morning and he asked us the same question that he asked his disciples on the way to Caesarea of Philippi, who do you say I am? Ask yourself this morning how you would respond. My guess is that even in this gathering, most of us have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. But there would still be a number of different answers to the question. And how we answer that question reveals a great deal about the way in which we expect Jesus to work in our lives. If you say Jesus was merely a good teacher or a good man, then maybe you'll treat him like a Dr. Phil or a Tony Robbins, some self-help guru You'll take the things Jesus said that are good and you'll try to apply them into your life, but you'll ignore the things that are hard for you to do or you don't want to do. If you say Jesus was merely a religious figure, then you'll treat him like a Muhammad or Confucius, the latest guru, and you'll view him as one of the many ways to God rather than remembering that there is but one way to God, and that is through the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you say, but if you say this morning that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God who came to earth to save us from our sins, who conquered sin and death and rules over us as Lord, then, and then, that will drastically change every single area of your life. See, the celebration of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, your belief in Jesus is absolutely crucial if we are to properly answer the question that Jesus poses to us. Who do you say I am? As Jesus enters into Sicily with his disciples, he first asks the disciples who others believe in him to be. And based on what the people had seen him say and do, his miracles, his healings, his preaching, they concluded that he was either a resurrected prophet of the old or a new prophet of the same kind. So they basically believed him to be a good religious figure of some prominence and importance. And that's actually pretty similar in the past years to where, where Americans have viewed Jesus to be even 2,000 years later. According to 2016, there was a survey done around Easter by the Barna Group, and nearly 92% of Americans agreed that Jesus was a real person who actually lived on the earth. But only half of those believed Jesus is God, with another quarter that said he was only a religious or spiritual leader. Even Peter himself, one of Jesus' closest disciples, in a time wrongly identifies him, as we read Matthew 16, 16, Peter answered Jesus' question of who he is by saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Peter correctly answers, but he still fails to understand the purpose for why Christ came. Later in Scripture, likely directly after this initial questioning, Jesus began showing his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things, and that he would be killed, and on the third day he would be raised. But Peter, in Matthew 16, 21, hearing these things, he pulls Jesus aside. And he says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turns to Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of God. Of man. You know what it felt like? Um, it felt like dad strength. You know, when you were a kid and you're wrestling with your dad, you know, and he's just taking all the hits and he's toying with you. And then, boom, he just takes you down. Jesus set in me straight that day. I felt a lot like that. Okay, okay, I know, I know. Hindsight is twenty twenty, but at that time and at that moment, I, I, I just couldn't figure out what he was talking about, you know? I mean, why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die? No, 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 not, not on my watch. This wasn't going to happen. No, sir. It just wasn't like he was he was thinking straight, you know? I kept thinking, maybe he's dehydrated, maybe he's hungry. The man never got enough to eat, if you ask me. So I take him aside, and I start get laying into him. And before I could even get very far, he stops me, he looks me in the eyes, because he has those eyes. And you know what he said to me? Get behind me, Satan. Dad strength. Those words, those eyes, that moment floored me. He floored me. <sighs> but I mean, seriously, get behind me, Satan. All right, I admit I have some flaws, you know, but Satan, I mean, that stung a bit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I just didn't get it. I just didn't see the whole picture, which won't be the last time that'll happen, mind you. <laughs> You see, I, I wanted him to use that, that dad strength on the world, you know? I mean, my desires, my plans. And your boy, Peter's plans, they don't always work out so good. I.e., ear slicing, etc. But he knew, he knew all along. <laughs> he would give us just enough rope for allow us to figure things out for ourselves. And then he just... He had that dad strength, you know? He pulls back in. Right at that moment, we needed saving from ourselves. That was his plan all along. Saving us from ourselves. Saving me from myself. Peter was fine with the Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and establish a physical kingdom, but he wasn't fine with a God who was willing to sacrifice his son. See, it's, in some ways it's easy for us to read Scripture and to take account of what happened and to... We don't put ourselves in that place. When I watched that video this week, and it really impacted me because I started to think, would I be any different than what Peter was then? If Jesus was before us today and he preached the same message, which he would preach over and over again, because he'd be willing to sacrifice time and time again if it was needed, I would be just like Peter. I would, I would deny him ever doing it wanting him to do it, because how could someone give his life for us? But our God did just that. 
See, our God gave us Jesus so that we could have life again with Him in heaven through the repentance of our sins and by believing in the one who gave His life for us. Mark 10, 45 says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. See, Peter couldn't understand the truth because God had not yet revealed it to him. And also because he didn't want to believe something so awful would beset our Savior. It was his resurrection that made it possible for Peter to believe. And it makes it possible for us to understand the Messiah that Jesus is. It is by the cross, his death, and resurrection from the grave that allows us to give the correct answer when Jesus asks, Who do you say I am? It is the resurrection that confirms everything that Jesus told Peter and the other disciples that day that resulted in Peter rebuking Jesus was in fact true. As Jesus was ministering with his disciples, there, there was reason for Jesus to rebuke. First, Jesus said that he would go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from Jewish religious leaders. That was no different in the time. Jewish religious leaders were used to people doing that. And, they, and in people doing that, they would almost delight in interrogating and making things difficult for those who dared to question the authority. So Jesus wasn't different in that way. Jesus said that he would be killed again. That didn't make Jesus unique. Jesus wasn't the first to be crucified. It was quite common in the Roman Empire since the government used that means of sending a message to the citizens that no dissension would be tolerated. And during the reign of the Romans, tens of thousands were killed by crucifixion, including the other two criminals who were executed with Jesus. But when Jesus claimed that he would be raised on the third day. That was a claim that no one had ever made before. The Son of the living God was the only one that could fill that promise. So once Peter finally came to realize that Jesus had indeed done what he said he would do, and that he was risen from the grave, Peter finally understood the kind of Messiah Jesus came to be. He had not come to deliver those people from the oppressive rule of the Romans, although one day he will return and set up his kingdom. He had not come merely to be a good teacher and to share some suggestions for living a better life, although by reading God's word and applying the principles that he has taught us, we will definitely live a more meaningful and abundant life through Christ. He did not come to merely heal every disease and to take away every trial, even though he is more than capable of doing so. Instead, he came to do something much more significant and permanent. He came to be a Messiah that would make it possible for all mankind to be able to be saved from their sin and guilt and death by taking it upon the cross, by paying the penalty of the sin and overcoming the death by rising from the grave. And it was the resurrection that proved his claim to be that kind of Messiah was 100% true. Who do you say that Jesus is this morning? Who do you say he is? Would you merely say that Jesus was a historical figure who lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago? Would you merely say that Jesus was just an important religious leader? Would you say that Jesus was a good teacher? And again, while all of those things are true, they don't begin to describe the fullness of who Jesus was. And even more important for you personally, none of those answers do anything to change your life right now or for the life to come. Or would you say like Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came to earth to live a sinless life, to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and that who would rise and conquer death so that you, each of you, can live an eternal life with him in heaven. This is the only answer that can transform your life in the present and in the life to come. But merely being able to answer that question in our minds is not enough. 
See, we like to be able to think something and to see it and believe it. But see, to believe is the harder thing. Belief takes something more than just our minds thinking. And it is the belief in Jesus Christ that is most important. Right before Jesus' death, the Bible accounts of the loss of his friend Lazarus, who died in Bethany near Jerusalem. Jesus arrived after Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, and before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said to Lazarus' sister Martha, in John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And Jesus said, do you believe this? See, the word believe there again is so much more than just an intellectual set of facts. Belief means to believe in something to the extent that you're willing to act on what you believe. It conveys the idea of trusting in something to the point that you're willing to stake your entire life on that belief. I would ask you this morning, what are you willing to stake your life on? Again, we, we stake our life so much on the physical, on my job, on my income, on my happiness, on my well-being. But all of those things, friend, though they don't seem like it now, are temporary in the end. We must stake in the eternal. And that stake in the eternal begins with Jesus Christ. The stake that you place in your belief in Jesus Christ this morning is the most important decision that you will ever make in this life. Peter knew the intellectual, but it wasn't until Peter saw the resurrection that he truly believed in why Jesus came. And we must, this morning, just as Peter did, we must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want that same type of faith that Peter had. I want to be able to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ every day. I want to be able to boldly endure through trials and tribulation and still be able to say that I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that whatever trials come my way on this earth, that I will believe them to be short and temporary compared to eternal life with our Father in heaven. And the good news is that we can all have that today. We can all believe in Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, you have to do as Peter did after the resurrection. You have to give up sometimes your preconceived ideas about what the Messiah came to be. You have to not only say like Peter did that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but you have to understand that means that He came to free you from the bondage of guilt of sin and to conquer death. Not just to give you an easy, convenient life. All of us have lived life long enough to know that life is not easy. That life is hard. That life brings us challenges. Sometimes challenges that we don't feel that we can overcome. Because the truth in the matter is, friends, you can't overcome them alone. It is only through our belief in Jesus Christ that we can overcome what life brings us and that we can find true happiness in a Savior that is alive, that loves you, that loves you and cares for you. We serve a God that loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. And it is that belief that we must have. Are you willing to have that kind of belief and to stake your entire life in the fact that Jesus is that kind of Messiah? It's such an important decision that it's not something that must be taken lightly. And it's one that each of us has to make personally in following after Jesus Christ. As our worship team comes up today, I would ask you that question this morning. What do you believe? And who do you say Jesus is? 
who do you say that Jesus is? I know that for many of you here this morning, you've already made a decision. And for you, my prayer is that you will celebrate in the resurrection this morning. And as we're reminded of what that resurrection reveals about the kind of Messiah we trust and serve, that you'll be even more grateful for what Jesus has done for you. And I pray that that gratefulness will result in a renewed commitment to share in Jesus, to obey Him, to minister to others in His name, and to proclaim Him to others. For others that have never made a decision to follow after Christ. Maybe today is a day that the Spirit speaks to you. It's a simple question to ask of who we say Jesus is, but it's the most important decisions, the ever most important question we will ever ask. I remember last Easter getting to baptize my son in that trough. And I remember that day that the decision that Caleb had made a month prior to that led to this baptism on that day. Of course, I was overwhelmed and emotional. You guys know I'm a very emotional person, and I was overwhelmed with emotion on that day. But it wasn't just for the decision he made, but I knew that that decision he made in that day, that it would impact him for the rest of his life. See, when you stake your claim in Jesus Christ, and when you stake it deep within your heart, and you trust in Jesus, and you ask Jesus to come live within your heart, that is something that will never be taken from you. This life could deal you a hand that you would never believe you could overcome. Trials will come your way. We will lose jobs, we will lose spouses, we will lose friends. We will never lose the love and the promise of Jesus Christ. And that is the most important decision we could ever make, is staking our claim in Jesus Christ and believing in a God that did send His Son, that did live a perfect life, that did set an example for us through His death on the cross that did take our sins and that through His blood there is forgiveness for our sins. I pray this morning that you know Him, that you believe in Him, and that when that question is asked, that you are confident in the assurance of Jesus Christ that lives within your heart. Because the truth in this is And I'm just being real. This isn't like a scare tactic by a pastor to you. Whether you answer the question now or you answer it in the life to come, we will all bow before a Savior and we will answer that question. So let the truth be now that the most important decision you make is to know the Jesus, the Messiah, the living God. Let's pray today. Father God, Lord, we love you and we just, we thank you for this Easter. We thank you, Father, in the remembrance of your son, Jesus. But not remembering as someone that's in the past, but remembering the sacrifice because we serve a living God that is with us here today. Father, the most important decision we could ever make in this lifetime is to put our trust, to stake our promise within you. Father, the most important question that we will ever ask is what we believe. And Father, I pray today that every single person within this room is confident of that answer. That they are confident in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, it is not enough to just to just intellectually know. It is not enough to just live a good life and to make the right decisions and to make the right choices. But Father, it is about believing and trusting and having faith in the name, the living name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there is one today that does not know you, Father, that the Spirit would convict them today 
and that, that they would put their promise and trust in you. Father, one day when this life ends, when you return, Father, we do not know the hour or the day. One day we will stand before you in glory and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, I pray for every heart within this room, for every spirit, Lord, that they would know you and put their trust in you. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for Easter. And we thank you that we serve a living God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with me, please, if our ushers would come today to collect our offering. And pray for our offering again in a moment. But I just, again, I want to encourage you. We, We want to be a church of prayer. We want to be a church that addresses the needs that God places upon your heart. And so I want to encourage you today, if, if there's a prayer that you need to come and, and to off, offer up to God, I pray that you do it. There are those today that will gladly step out of where they are and to come and pray with you. And if you have never made a decision in Jesus Christ, and that is just something that is pulling on your heart, I pray you come forward today. You answer that question and you make it right with the Lord. Let's pray again for our offering. Father, we thank you for an opportunity we have to give back to you, Father. And we thank you for the ministry of what you're doing through this church. And not just our church, Father, but we represent the greater body of church, Father. We are your church. And Father, we want to go forward and to do great things in your name. It is only through your name, Father, that we can accomplish anything that is good. So, Father, I pray that our hearts would be right in giving, Father, and that you would just magnify the gift today. And, Lord, that this ministry will touch lives, that it will change lives, and that the name of Jesus will go forward from this church and will impact a community that needs you. Father, thank you for the gift today and for those that give. In Jesus' name, amen. Come forward if you need prayer.